That's a wrap with me. Ah. Since the completion of Highlander 2, the introduction of digital technology into the realm of special effects has lifted the barriers that confine the imagination and have allowed the filmmakers the unique opportunity of improving the visual effects that were never fully realized. Going from the analog to the digital world essentially is like the invention of the airplane. You go from kind of how far can you drive to how far can you fly. Now we're up in the supersonic range. We haven't quite hit light speed yet, but we're definitely at supersonic. And so we can fly a hell of a long way. One of the biggest differences in then versus now is in the area of matte painting. And what we did originally was an extremely complex process of latent image matte painting. It was developed in like 1930 or something, where you shoot the live action and then you notch the film and open the camera, notch the film, shoot another take, notch the film. Then a matte painter starts painting and you expose one foot at a time of this thing. And you try to paint on a double exposure and re-expose the film. You reload it and reshoot it, which is an incredibly time-consuming process. So it was a very volatile technology. This is where the shield was projected in. This is a photographic element. This was original negative. It would then be re-exposed. Black there, and then put the two together and re-expose this as a third pass. So it's like a uh, giant optical printer. Of course, now today, we digitally paint onto three-dimensional structures with real windows put in, with real shots of glass, and the painters blend it all together and stuff. So now what you've got is you've got a three-dimensional photograph that you can look at. Now you're building essentially a virtual model world. It's a purely virtual space. It is a real object. You can design any move, you can relight, you can do all sorts of stuff, which is a vastly different way than sitting with a piece of glass and saying, does it look right? They'll remember this day for a thousand years, the day we protected the planet from the sun. Without the shield, you don't have Highlander 2. One of the difficulties of a concept like the shield is that it could be anything. It's not like saying, you know, this is the landing on the moon and we've all seen the landing on the moon. This is a shield which envelops the earth of massive energy that's always changing and fluxing. In Highlander 2, originally we designed a system of laser animation, of painting with light directly with lasers and controlling those for the quickening effect and for the entire shield effect. For the first time with a touch screen, you could just draw and the character of what you would draw like lightning or whatever would appear like right in front of you in real time in 16 million colors and you'd just shoot it. And that became the element. When McLeod is going up above the shield, all that stuff that's shooting around, it's all live laser light. It's all done with pure white light lasers broken into 16 million colors and hand drawn, which nothing existed like that to that point, and nothing has ever existed like that since then. It's a completely unique tool that was designed specifically for Highlander 2, and then has never been used on any other film. Computer graphics essentially kind of eclipsed that in the long run, but it was beautiful because we could see it live, big. I mean, the shield was like this whole room, this thing happening all around that you could actually see physically. You could stand in the shield, a miniaturized version of it, and you could see this stuff shooting around. It's really cool. I think we shot 50,000 feet of elements that never even made it to the screen because we just didn't have enough time to even review all the material, much less finesse it and fit it together and make it happen. Now we've got complete digital access to every frame that we shot, plus another image bank of material that we're creating for this movie. I've had the creative discussions with Russell and Bill, and we've been able to all agree that, of course, the shield should be a tone of blue over a blue set. It should follow the lead that was established in the production design and principal photography in the direction. Of course, it can't be its own little world out there. You know, it's got to be made and cut from the same fabric. And so that's really what we're doing here, is we're evening out everything, and then we're adding to the movie inspirationally, where we can really go well beyond where we even thought we could go in the original. The shield is now predominantly a 3D effect. 
3D motion graphics didn't exist when we did this movie, not on a commercial level. So we cheated with a lot of, you know, real kind of liquid nitrogen and lasers and stuff. But now we can really control it, which will give it a tremendous amount more synthetic depth. It'd be nice for that sheet lightning effect we were talking about, yeah. about the, you know, the random element that mm -hmm. just chases through this world right. like sheet lightning. Ramirez's plan was originally a DC-3, which is a cool retro look. Of course, it has the brilliant red shield behind it, the seven feet of, you know, <laughs> the footage that had to be reused by mandate. And yet, of course, the plane had been shot with blue reactive light on it, because when we shot the plane, we all thought the shield was going to be blue. We're replacing, clearly, the shield, and we're going to replace completely. The plane is going to be, you know, like a physical 3D object that you can get right up and look at the rivets on it and you can do kind of a United Airlines maneuver on this thing to see Sean Connery and my beautiful future wife sitting in the set. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes is the scene where Kristoff is first feeling the clicking effect. The coordination of Phil's photography, of Russell's directing, and of our effects animation, this electrical creature that like it starts to embody itself into this thing that crawls across the ground towards him and strikes him. It transitions from just a mere visual effect that had been kind of in the first quickening effects to a creature, to something with personality that's gonna strike this guy. I wouldn't touch that effect today. I think it's perfect. It does exactly what we wanted it to do. It's one of those rare effects that you can look at 15 years later, although the technology's changed and everything else, and you say, the character that went into that is so good, so clean. It expresses the dramatic intent of that scene perfectly. So that's one that we're certainly not gonna change. Today we're here in an early stage of the process where we're looking at preliminary composites, which are being done by a number of people. They're preliminary matte paintings, their new shield looks, their new 3D CGI being implemented, and we're exploring. This one is probably the closest in terms of the architectural density of the shot. So we're mixing kind of a look of Prague, that Frank Lloyd Wright neoclassic kind of right. rind cake thing which is going on here. Okay. And the dome. There's a reverse from this structure when they're fighting. Um, There's a reverse where you see down like that, so we just make sure that whatever you do to this, that it doesn't conflict with when they see that. Uh, okay. So here's the dome element. Here's the frog element. Here's the Frank Lloyd Wright. And you've got a couple of just modern shapes in here which work pretty well. They're, you know, undefined. What works about this is you got kind of one of each to set the mood, and then you just build it out with kind of ND buildings okay. uh, around that. And then what doesn't work in this one is the whole thing is so cyan. So we need to, like the street lights that are coming up from down in here mm -hmm. could be warmer. This one, the way it's working right now, has too much prog in it. It's like all prog, and it's too thick. You know, we've got spire, 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 spire fit. You almost count the elements. It's it's heavy on the prog side. It doesn't have enough Frank Lloyd Wright. There's also nothing wrong with being able to identify the fact we saw that in the because we are in the same yeah. geographic area. You so recognize the same recognizing yeah. the building would be sure. It's a cold city and the warm elements that we want to put into it. Broken neon lights, like the diner sign. So yeah. almost everything should have some element of neon buried somewhere in there. Even if you don't see the neon, you see the reactive light from the neon. The other thing that's working great here are these little warm windows. They could be even warmer, really yellowy, fire. As, if, as, as if people are burning barrels of fire yeah. inside their house so it flickers and yeah, yeah. What's really great is this reactive flash on the, the highway. That looks totally real to me, this part. So certain things in, in the shots are working great. It's, it's, it's just we've got to get them all to be consistent. OK, boys, let's make this a good one. The world is watching. Ignition. Visual effects work in terms of what we call turnarounds. You know, you conceive everything, you pre-visualize it, you try to get some vision of what this is going to look like.
And the first vision looks pretty damn rough. It's like little stick figures, and it's kind of one step away from a storyboard. And then it goes from there over a period of months to a perfectly refined, seamless visual effect. It may go through 30, 40, 50 iterations of seeing it and then fixing it, seeing it, fixing it, see, turning the turnovers. In an analog world, it may take many days to even see one turnaround. Now we can see a turnaround in 15 minutes. So you can have bam, 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 bam. You turn it over, you go, okay, try that, try that, try that, try that. Great, okay. Then you go at it again the next day. And, and the really complicated shots, you can work at multiple resolutions, you can work at low res and see all sorts of cool stuff really fast, and then bump it up to high res, put you know 100 computers on it in a render farm, and see it come out the next morning. And critically, a shot that has maybe 200 layers to it, you can go into layer 157 and change the color and move it a little bit and see it again. So that it's not like having to work your way down through the layers and say, oh, that one's buried in the middle, we can't touch it, which is what the analog world's all about. Every one of those layers in this tremendously intricate book, you can pull them and access any page of the book and alter it and put it back in again seamlessly. This is everything that we've retransferred to HD. And these are the ones that we've been looking at this morning to get the style of it down. And we'll track them all the way out. Yeah, I think the number of effect shots is something like two or 300. Quite honestly, we're not even counting them. We're just doing them. I'm not a purist, I guess you'd say, in absolute digital has to solve everything. I think it's like a good recipe, I mean, you want a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you mix it all up, and pretty soon you don't know what's real and what's not, and people don't care whether it's digital or not. The digital has become the best way to put it all together, undoubtedly. I kind of miss the analog, physical aspect of it. It's become such a mental vapor business. Like, the difference between getting a handwritten letter in the mailbox and getting an email. One's fast, and, but the other one's really beautiful. So a lot of things have changed, and a lot of things stayed exactly the same. And so it's kind of getting to go back and revisit those things and realize how valuable the changes are in one's life. You know, it's, it's a life's unique project for me, because Highlander 2 is probably the most influential project that I've ever done, because it really, truly changed my life on a personal level and on a professional one.